Aksiva Vachasima Tova to all of the listeners. We want to acknowledge Torah anytime the beautiful, magnificent forum that they are allowing so many Yidden worldwide to be able to enjoy the Divrei Torah which comes on their station each and every week. Uh, in two days is Rosh Hashanah. I spoke last week a little bit about Rosh Hashanah and I'm going to continue this evening uh, and then next week, Bezos Hashem, we will speak about Parshas HaZinu and Yom Kippur. And the week after will be between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. We will speak about Sukkot, Hoshana Rabbah, Shemini Atzeres, and Simchas Torah, Bezos Hashem. Now, we know that in Tafresh Gimel in Shulchan Aruch, that the halacha stated there is that pas akum is mutter. That if a person, if a goy makes bread, there's a whole discussion, is it mutter, is it oser, that it is mutter. However, in Shulchan Aruch it says that the aseris yemei hatshuva, that when you come to the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that a bal nefesh should do everything he can to be machmer. Now the question asked worldwide is what does this halacha mean? Maman If pasakum is oser, it should be oser a whole year. And if it's mutter, so why is there an Indian between Aser Yemei Tshuva, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, not to eat it, to only eat bread which a Yid either ignited the fire or was the actual Mashkiach, and it's called Pas Yisrael. So the answer given is that and Rashi in the Gemara Nida talks about this Indian of Baal Nefesh and a few of the other Chazal mention the term and what they come out with is that a person during a Seris Yemei Tshuva should elevate himself to a position to sharpen his Yerushamayim, and the way, and that's what they mean by Baal Nefesh, and therefore, even though technically it is Mutter, but nevertheless, a person realizing that he's being looked at with a microscope in terms of the upcoming year, should try to put himself into a position to do better. You know, Rav Hutner used to say that a person, Rosh Hashanah, doesn't have to get better. He has to change. Because everything that we keep doing throughout life, under the cloak of, well, I'm trying, I'm doing, it's not so. The person, if he really was challenged, uh, if it was the life of his family, he would take on certain Kabbalahs and live up to it. And if it was a question of something that he said on Rosh Hashanah and wanted to fulfill it, if he really felt the need, he would push himself to do it. But the problem is that we are so used to and we are so involved at the level of what we have done that it's simply as a human being hard to get out of it. And the person who does get out of it, he's the lucky person. He's able to realize 
that each and every day is something that we take for granted, but we should never, ever take for granted. And I must share with you, even though I usually only quote Chazal and things like that, but there was such a starking event that happened this week that I share it with you because even the Goyim Lahavdil were talking about this Indian. And what was it? There was, I think it was a football player named Rogers. Now, I don't know if he plays for football or I'm making a mistake. Maybe he plays for baseball or for basketball. But anyway, he plays for a team and he was hired this year, a two-year contract, $40 million a year. And on the first half hour of the game of the first very day, he twisted his ankle or something in his foot and he became disqualified, he couldn't do it. And he's out for the season and maybe for the entire year. Now here is somebody who was planning on buying a $20 million house, as they wrote, because he was gonna make $40 million a year. And he was from the Hall of Fame. This wasn't some beginner, this was a star. And that's why they were paying such tremendous money. And in one minute, the Rabbana Shaloylam took away everything from him. By what he did to his foot, the doctor said there's no way he could play this season and maybe not even again because he's 38 years old and that's considered a little bit older in the playing field of these players. And it was a stark reminder, and I heard a goy saying that he told his son as soon as this happened, you see that God could do anything in this world to somebody, and it could have an immediate direct effect on the rest of his life. And that's how we as Yid really should look of Hashgach protis of how <clears throat> specific the format of this world is that in a second something can happen and the person is out of the playing field. So we have to, when we take a look at Rosh Hashanah and we're maminim b'nei maminim that really Come Rosh Hashanah, it is a day of judgment. Yom Kippur is not a day of judgment. It's a day of forgiveness. And that's why the Zohar HaKadosh calls Rosh Hashanah Zohov, gold, because gold has a fiery shine too in it. And Yom Kippur is called Kesef, silver because in silver there's a whiteness to it, and because you didn't come out from Yom Kippur cleansed and a clean slate, so therefore it's called Kesef. But Rosh Hashanah itself is a Yom Hadin, as I mentioned to you by Arichas last week. Now, we know that on Rosh Hashanah, we say in Musaf, there are ten psukim of Malchios, Zechronos, and Shofros. And we don't do it on Yom Kippur unless it's a Yoival year. That means if Yoival fell out that year, on Yom Kippur, we say Shemana Esrei the way we do on Rosh Hashanah. And we say all the ten psukim of Malchios, Zechronos, and Shofros. <coughs> Excuse me. But 
but on a regular year, we don't on Yom Kippur. We say Rosh Hashanah, the regular brachas, and then when we come into Musaf, that we add on these psukim. And the Gemara asks, why do we say, let's say, 10 psukim of Malchios? And the Gemara interestingly answers that in Parshas Emor, which is a Parsha filled with Yomtiv, we have discussion of Pesach, we have discussion of Shavuos, we have discussion of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. We have a discussion of everything there. And in, tucked in, the HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in putting the Torah together, put in Uva Kutzrechem es Ketzir Artzachem Lo Sechala Pa'as Sodcha Bekutzrecha that there's mention of Leket, Shikha, and Peya. So the Gemara Darshans, that since we mention at the end of that Pasuk about Leket, Shikha, and Peya, Ani Hashem Elokeichem, and right after that is the Pasuk about Uvayom HaShvi'i, Uvachodesh HaShvi'i, Be'echod Lachodesh, that means Rosh Hashanah, the seventh month, the first day, that since Ani Hashem Elokeichem is right next to it, and it begins with Uvayom HaShvi'i, Vachodesh HaShvi'i, that that's a sign, because what's Ani Hashem Elokeichem? It's Malchias. It's the fact that Kodesh Baruch Hu is the Melech, and that is the theme of the entire Rosh Hashanah. You see, if you went up to people on the street and you asked them, what are you daven for, for on Rosh Hashanah? So many would answer and say, well, I have an uncle in the hospital that's sick. I'm going to daven for him. And uh, I have a cousin that didn't do a shidduch and already, she's in her 40s. I'm going to daven for her. And there's a whole, and I have a cousin that has no parnasa. That's what I'm going to daven for Rosh Hashanah, that the year should be good. Yet, if you take a look at Shemona Esrei, there's not a word mentioned about Refua Shalema. There's not a word about parnasa, And there's not, excuse me, not one word about Shaduchim or having children or in the Avinu Malkenu that we say Rabbi Akiva made he's the one who wrote Avinu Malkenu and it's Kodesh Kedoshim it's 26 stanzas Kenegadi Yudke Vavke so we have there Shalach Rufu Shalem but not in Shemon Esrei because Shemona Esrei ele is elevated Rosh Hashanah to the theme of Malchus Shamayim, that the heavenly kingdom of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and the majesty of his royalty. And that is the theme. Ve'yasu chulam agudo echos, lasos ritzon chobolev av sholem, v'sim lo chatohu ha'shem elokeinu meher levadecho. Look at the themes in each and every paragraph. So we are enveloped in the realm of Malchus Shemayim. So the... Uh, Gemara says in Rosh Hashanah that since Ani Hashem Elokeichem is there, and the very next words is the next Pasuk, Uva Chodesh HaShvi, Be'achod LaChodesh, referring to Rosh Hashanah. So that's why we have to put Malchios from Ani Hashem Elokeichem into the Shemona Esrei on Rosh Hashanah because Rosh Hashanah is mentioned right thereafter. But the truth is that that is not the Mephoshim say 
the keynote idea that we're trying, the Gemara is trying to convey. convey. Because where is that Ani Hashem Elokeichem? It's right in the Pasuk about giving Leket Shikha and Peya, and it's giving it to the Oni, and it comes out right in the middle of all the Sukkim about Yomtiv. What is it doing there? So the Mephoshim explain that the possibility that is derived, what comes out from the fact that we give Leket, Shikha, and Peya, that that is the theme of every single Yom Tov, not just the Rosh Hashanah. About saying the ten Pesukim Malchios, that's specifically. But for all the other things, so the Mephoshim are curious. I mean, okay, Leket, Shikha, Peya, it's a mitzvah, but it's so overriding and so overwhelming. But the answer they say is yes, because even when a person gives tzedakah, which I always hammer away how big tzedakah is and how no one should ever lose the opportunity of tzedakah and what a person gains with tzedakah, but it is not comparable to the tzedakah of Leket, Shikha, and Peya. Why? Because the ego is completely eliminated. You see, when a person gives tzedakah, if he's a Bal Madrega, he'll think while he's giving it, the Rabbana Shalom gave me the power and the money to give. And many people still, when they give it, they're looking at the Yoni, that they're the one giving and they should appreciate it and they should... But when it comes, like a chick and pay the Rabbanu Shalom says it's not yours. The edge of your field, it's not your decision who and what and if you want to give. Like we give a person, you give your 20%, so you want to give another 5%, we give you that prerogative, they give you that choice to do it. But Leket, Shikha, and Peya is something that the person from his own field gives because he does not have the control. He was told to just walk away and leave it and not go back and not choose anyone who should take it, but he should have it right there. That's really pure tzedakah because he has no control. There's no ego involved that he feels good that he gave to this one money and to that one. There's no human dimension. And that's why Ani Hashem Elokeichem is very befitting from a Pasuk about Leket, Shikha, and Peah that we remind ourselves this is not my, I own the field. But that portion of it is not mine. That's the Rabbana Shalolim's. Oh, you are mocker the Rabbana Shalolim that he is the one in the driver's seat? That gives us the incentive to make the drusha from that Ani Hashem Elokeichem of Leket, Shikha, and Peya and to have us say ten psukim of Malchios for the Shemona Esrei uh, in Musaf. Now, the Chazon Ish was once asked by a father that, and the Chazon Ish lived 60 years ago, we're not talking 500 or 1,000 years ago, and the father asked the Chazon Ish that I have two choices where to daven on Rosh Hashanah. One choice is to go back to my yeshiva that has a serious davening, but it is so packed that I cannot bring my son with me. And he would end up davening in the shul where we daven every Shabbos. He would go there, and he was a younger child, so... He would go, 
uh, and I would be in the yeshiva, or should I go to the regular shul, which is in no comparison to the yeshiva's fervency and and level of of that you're encompassed within an atmosphere of total, you know, in yeshivish. Anyone who's davening the yeshiva knows exactly what I'm talking about. So the Chazon Yish answered him and said, go to the shul, don't go to yeshiva. Because in the shul you can be with your son. And a son needs the image and the, the role model aspect right in front of his eyes. Many people who don't cry a whole year in Shemana say, cry, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And the Chazanish cited that. And he said, your son should see you crying on Rosh Hashanah. That's going to make the indelible imprint on him. So we have to realize that there's a 48-hour setting, which is a Yom Arichta. It has nothing to do with a Sveika de Yoima in Eretzrael. They also have two days but it's all under one umbrella. It's called a Yom, the Gemara calls it a Yom Arichta, which means that all of the ingredients that are in the minutes of Rosh Hashanah are in the realm of super holiness. And we're in an abode, we're in a realm above and beyond our whole year. I told you once that Yaakov Avinu fought with Esav about Elo because they saw in Shemayim that each one could be shoilet, could have the impression and the imprint on a month. And Yaakov right away grabbed Nisan and Ir, Sivan, and Esav then took Tammuz of an Elul. And when they met and had that fight with the Sarshal Esav, Yaakov Avinu, it was about Elul that they were fighting. That most of the Kabbalah firm and, and Medrashim talk about that there were a few issues, but the most important issue to Yaakov Avinu was Elul. Who would have the Shlita of Elo? He knew before Mashiach you have to throw a bone to a to the Goyim. So he had to give something. That was not an option. And indeed, you see all the trouble we had from Tamazanov those first two months. But Yaakovina didn't fight about that. He only fought about the Elo because he knew that a, that Klal Yisrael coming into a Rosh Hashanah without the mindset and the setting of an Elul, that they would be shorthanded. They would be very deficient in the effectiveness of a Rosh Hashanah without the month of Elul. And Yaakov Avinu indeed won that fight. So he got four months out of the six and lucky for Klal Yisrael, a mazel, that we were able to go into Rosh Hashanah in the Mitz Hashem Abal Lenu in two days, that we will be able to go in to Rosh Hashanah with the power of all the Tekiya Shoifer we had in El Ladovar Hashem Oiri, the Tillim, and Svardim say even Slichas a whole Elo. The, the we the Ashkenazim we Paschal like the Ramah, and we don't have an entire month. We only start with we started this past Motsui Shabbos, and today is the fifth day. Now I want to share with you a Mogan Avram. The Mogan Avram says over that there was a person in his time that took the shoifer, he was appointed to sound the shoifer, to blow shoifer on Rosh Hashanah, 
And he, when the time came, he took the shoifer and he blew it and no sound came out. So he writes that what did the person do? He turned over the shoifer because we blow the shoifer from the thin end. But he turned over the shoifer and from the big end, he whispered into it the Pusik, Vihi Noyam Hashem Elokeinu Oleinu Masa Yodeinu Konana Oleinu Masa Yodeinu Konaneo. He whispered into it, then he turned it back around and he blew the shoifer beautifully. So the Mefarshim are curious why would the Mogan Avram who was a poisic. I mean, he was so poor, the Mogan Avram, that it is told that he had to write half of the Shulchan Aruch that he wrote on the wall of his house because he didn't have money to buy the paper. He didn't have paper. So, but he was careful with whatever he wrote. Why does he tell us this story? It's not Nogea to... to the Kiyam HaMitzvah of Shoifer. And the whole thing, why to tell us that Vihinoyam, he said Vihinoyam, I mean, he's not suggesting that we say Vihinoyam, even though we do say Vihinoyam because of the Arizal. You see, the Arizal explains, and this the Mogan Avram does not say, but the Arizal does say it, that when a person comes to do a mitzvah, it is so great that he, down here in Olam Azai, he can't see the effect in Shemayim. means when he takes a nickel or a dollar and he hands it to an oni, or he takes a pair of tefillin to put it on and he's not dreaming about the stock market or other nonsense, but he's thinking about the mitzvah, asher kenishanu, the mitzvos of its ivanu, lahoniach tefillin. At that minute, he's first of all, it's a tremendous nachas ruach ta'kodesh baruch hu. Number two, he's bekaim, being bekaim a mitzvah seidiyaraisa, and at that moment in shamayim. It's like he pushed a button down here and the whole heavenly abode became lit up. And we just, we put on the mitzvah, we know the, the tefillin, we know it's a mitzvah, we give the proof to tzedakah, and we know it's having a nice effect, but to the level of the effect, it do, doesn't re realize it. So... There's a big kitrig every time we do a mitzvah. And that's why the Arizal says that the Samach Mem wants to stop you when you're doing a mitzvah. He doesn't want it to happen. So he suggested before every mitzvah, and that's why before we take matzah, we say, Vihi noyam, we say, and why is it that specifically that Pusik is the Pusik? Because the Pusik of Vihi noyam has five news in it. Vihi noyam Hashem nu, that's the first. Oleinu, the second. Mase yodeinu, konaneu, but I, I, I miss vihi noyam Hashem elokeinu, Oleinu Masa Yodeinu Koneo. You'll look at the Pasuk, you'll see there are five news. Nu is Begamatria 56. And 56 times 5 is 280. Now we know that there are 280 categories of Mekatrigim and Shemayim that are out to stop us from doing mitzvahs. And it's called the Rapach Nitsutsin, that the, the Mekatrigim. And we come with the mitzvah and we wash them away. And that's what happens by Takiyah Shoifer. 
I mean, let's face it, the whole year we have a bushel basket of Averis. Some bigger, some smaller. But the Schäufer is like a grenade that wipes it away. So before we say any mitzvah or do any mitzvah, we say vihinoyam because that is the five news, Bigamatria 280, and we're able, 288, sorry, that we are able to wipe away the Samach Mem, says the Arizal. So this person, who was a Yerei Shemayim, he took the shoifer, he saw it wasn't going, the Sutton was not letting him blow shoifer, and he whispered into the shoifer, and that did the trick. And he was able to blow shoifer. So it wasn't that the Mogan Avram is telling you a story, just some interesting story. He's telling it to you that he used the segula that many tzaddikim used. And today, almost everyone says vihinoyam before they do a choshev and a very special mitzvah. Now, it says, and the Shem Shmuel makes this statement, that like the Rambam says, Soif Yisrael Lasos Tshuva Besof Geulasam. That Klal Yisrael is going to end up doing Tshuva. You see, the Rambam in one place says that there were two Bote Migdash and then two Golasim. That the first Tochacha of Bechukosai ends off. So says the Rambam that because of that ending, because it corresponds to the first Golos, to the first, to the Golos Bovel. It's not the first Golos, Mitzrayim was the first Golos. But here we had the Golos Bovel. And of the main four that affected Klal Yisrael, the first was Golis Bovel. And, but we were told that it's going to be for only 70 years. It would be for a period of 70 years. And just like it was said, it was for 70 years. And then they came back and they rebuilt the second base of Migdash. So says the Rambam that that's the reason, the Mepharshim on the Rambam, that that's the reason that the Toichachem Bechukos, I ended up with a good statement that's going to be good, because you're going to see it shortly, that it's good. But the second Toichachov Kisavo, it doesn't have any good statement at the end. It does not have any good statement, because that is a prolonged Golos that we are still suffering from. We're over 2,000 years. The first one was just 70 years. We're over 2,000 years in Golos and still suffering. But, says the, the Meforshim, that when it will come to Parshish Nitzavim, which is right after, there you have inside of it some Nechamas which means the long drawn out, you will not see the Nechama. But there will come a time that there will be a Nechama. And all of them, just like the Rambam said, that we are able to do it only <clears throat> with the tshuva. And tshuva is so powerful that the Gemara says that the Rabbana Shalom, if he looks at a person and he sees that it's exactly half and half, half Averis and half Mitzvahs, he takes out the extra one that could weigh over the good, the bad that could weigh over the good, 
that he could weigh over he could weigh over the good and he takes away that Avera, the Gemara says, and he puts it into cold storage. And he waits to see what the person does. Does he continue with just the Averas? Then he tosses that Avera. He doesn't throw away the Avera. He tosses it into the basket with the Averas, and he's done, and he does something to the person. But if the person does the opposite, He's moving along and he does tshuva little by little. Then he's going to end up way on top. That HaKadosh Baruch who knows that this is a weak door. And the Shem is Shmuel who was the Avne, Avne Nezer's son said that most people can't stand up to it. But there's a Pasik. Vishova Shemelokecha is Shivuscha Varicha Mecha. Now the translation of that pas Pasik is that Hashem will bring back the captives. Shivuscha, your captives, those who are in captive. He translated it differently. That Hashem will bring back as Shivuscha all of your chuva that you did throughout the generations, a little here, a little there, even a balaveira sometimes has a, 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 a hero tshuva. I mean, I know a bal tshuva who was going to a Broadway show with his family in his car, Lahavdil. And he opened up the window in Manhattan and he asked, and he asked the policeman, why is there so much traffic? I have to get 7.30, the play is beginning. And he answered, the policeman said, don't you know, this was an Italian policeman, don't you know tonight is Yom Kippur? And he was struck like lightning. And he turned around to his family, his wife and children in the car. We're not going to any play tonight. And today he is a full chosid wife with a shaitel, kids in, in uh, yeshiva. Why? Because there was a hearer tshuva that struck this man the Italian policeman knows it's Yom Kippur and I am Jewish and I don't know? And it changed his life, the remark of a Goyesha policeman. And everyone, even the biggest Balavera, first of all, half the Yidden today don't even know that you could do, you can't do, they don't know. I'm not talking about the reform who are told to do things that are absolutely usser and that they try to rationalize and justify and all of that. But you have people who don't even go to these reform ham and cheese eating temples. They don't even go there. They sit at home. Some of them don't even know. I remember somebody on the Intrepid. I used to give the invocations on the Intrepid. I did it for um, 15 years before their once a year main event. And the person who was like the administrator in those days, this is 20 years ago, of the Intrepid. So he says, Rabbi, I'd like very much to speak to you. Would you be willing to come? Uh, I said, well, when would you like me to come to meet you? He said, how about Monday at one at 2 o'clock? So I said, I don't want to say the man's name, but I said to him, Mr., did you ever hear of Yom Kippur? And he said, I am a shame. I'm over 90. That's what he said. And I remember growing up with my grandfather's, uh, of course, Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur. And today I don't even know that it's Yom Kippur. So we have to sharpen the sword 
of the tshuva that we do because that's going to be the thing that's going to bring us back, the tshuva. But we have to try harder to make the tshuva pure and wonderful and fine and be able to be effective that no matter how little we have, and that's what the Shem is Shmuel says, his Loshan is that even if it's a tiny bit of tshuva, but it's tshuva that something that has a purity to it can carry the day for him when he's being judged, when the Shiach will come. It's that tshuva that can make all of the difference. Now, the idea of the shoifer, why did he blow into the opposite end? You're not Yoitsa Takias with, with blowing into the other end. Uh, why did he do it? And the answer is because this is Oilam Hazeh, and we have to put our foot forward to always try the most. You see, trying does not get you in America. If you built a business for 20 years and it kept losing money, you're a failure. If suddenly it picks up and you do well, you're now doing well, you're not a failure anymore. But if today you're the failure, you're not making any money, then you're not on the list of successful people. By Yidin, it's the opposite. If a Yid went in to do an endeavor and he did it sincerely and he did it with his heart and his soul, his neshama and his everything, whether he succeeds or not, that's the Rabbana Shalom's business. He's not in the driver's seat how things will turn out, but he is in the driver's seat to at least try it. And that the Mephoshim say is why the Mughan Avram brought this story to tell you that when a Yid takes a shoifer and fails, he has to try something else on the spot. He can't throw up his hands. And that goes likewise for the power of tefillah, tillim. We don't know how it's going to end up, will this person live that we're saying tillim for? We don't know if he's a Gilgal that he had to just make people give tzedakah and daven for him and that was his purpose in world. Now he went back to his parents and grandparents and to everybody else up there. We don't know the cheshboinus. But we do have to try our best to succeed. And that's why the Mepharshim say that, that, that the Magen Avram brought the fact that he turned around the shoifer because he thought maybe something was inside the shoifer, that he could blow it out, that he could do something which would make a difference. And that would explain the medrash that says Reb Hanina went out into a field and he found a gorgeous stone. And he wanted to pick it up and bring it to the base of Migdash. And the Medrash says that he couldn't do it. And he, he saw a group of men and he asked them if they would help carry it with him to the Beis HaMikdosh. And they asked for an exorbitant amount of money to, yes, we'll do it, but we want so much and so much money. And the Medrash says that suddenly there were five very strong people who showed up by the stone. And Reb Hanina didn't know where they came from. And they said, we will carry the stone for you and we want a nickel. In other words, they wanted like some like a coin, not the $10,000 that these other guys wanted. And they carried it with him to the Beis Migdosh. 
And the minute they put it down in the place, the Medrash says that Reb Hanina wanted it to be in the base of Migdash, they disappeared. And he realized that they were angels, they were malochim, that they were pure angels that Hashem had sent him because he wanted so much to bring this gift into the Beis Amigdash, which really shows that we have to be ready and able to try and do our best. And that is all under the umbrella of tshuva. Now, there is a halacha that if somebody is walking out of a shul and he hears Takiyah Shoifer, um, so, the, so it, says, it says that if, the Gemara says, that if he's machaven to be, that means he's not standing inside the shul, but he hears the Takiyah Shoifer. And the mitzvah on Rosh Hashanah is to hear the shoifer. So this person was standing outside. So the Gemara says, if he had in mind to be yoitza, he's yoitza. But if he didn't have in mind, then he's not yoitza at all. And then it continues, the Gemara and says, or if he lives next door, another example meaning that his house is so close to the shul that he can hear the tekiah shoifer, but he's not there. He's not, and that goes also the same way. If he was, had in mind kavana to be yoitza, then he is able to be yoitza, and if not, not. So, The Meforshim say that, I mean, the Gemara says that the guy in the house could be that he heard the shoifer, but he thought it was the sounds of a donkey. That's what the Gemara says. The sounds of a donkey. So, of course, he's not Yoitzah. So the Mephorshim bring out a point from this halacha, from this what the Gemara says. Because the Gemara, the Mephorshim right away asks, if it says that he was Mechavin, then he's Yoitza. Why do you have to go and say the opposite now? And if he wasn't Mechavin, you understand by the statement that if he was Mechavin, he's Yoitza. And if he wasn't Mechavin, he's not Yoitza. So what do you have to come and make the same? Oh, im lochi vein, that we didn't have the kavana. So the answer the Meforshim say that the person is not an idiot. He knows it's Rosh Hashanah. And he's right there and he hears the shoifer. How could he think it's a donkey? And the Mephoshim say, because it's speaking to the people that don't even know, Yidden, don't know that you've got to be in the shul listening to Shoifer. And that if you hear any sound, you could think it's a don it's anything. It's a rooster, it's a donkey, it's anything. Else. So we, and that message is to us, because there's so much that we are really aware of, we miss things, we miss a Zman Krishma, we miss an opportunity in shul for a shear, for an interesting shear, for things that we can participate and partake in, and we don't avail ourselves. And those who are the people that the Gemara is referring to thought that it was a donkey outside that was making the sounds. So when we come into Rosh Hashanah, we have to have the resolve. Everything I told you last week about the Kodesh Kedoshim, all the Simonim, and taking the apple and Skeneged, the Tapuchim, the Sneya Tapuchim, Lamala, that it has so many ramifications, and that's why it's three equal things the Davening, the Tillim, the sh secondly, the Shoifer, and the third thing, the Sudos. 
It's not like some time out, we're going out for a Sunday afternoon picnic now. Because you have to eat, so we're going to eat, and then we're going to get serious again. Those seudos are koidish kadoshim, and that we have to react and respond to each and every aspect with the enthusiasm, with the ava and yira that we need to have when we do the mitzvahs and the minhagim, which many hold sometimes the shorish of a minute could be higher than the mitzvah even. Aksiva vachasima tova.